Good evening, wherever you may be. God bless you all endlessly, brothers and sisters. And to everyone, to all our brothers and sisters, and to all who are joining us, and all of us who are seeking the Lord. Good evening. Because let's not forget what the Bible tells us, that all who seek the Lord shall find them. All who call shall be answered to. And so being here, seeking the Lord, becomes a great blessing for each and every one of us. In addition, of course, to the fact that every time that we come together and that we congregate and every time that we come to meditate on the Lord and to think on Him, to praise and worship Him, we feel that shelter. We feel hope. We are given that breath of hope. We are giving that refreshment to our lives and our souls with fills our hearts with joy and happiness. And this, we owe all this to the fact that the Spirit of God is here with us, dwelling with us and in us. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. That is why we are going to praise Him and worship Him with this gathering, with this service that we will dedicate to Him. And we will do so by, by start, and we will start by doing, uh, pr by praying to the Lord and presenting this service to Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, King of greatness, God of heaven, you, O oh Lord, are our shelter. You are our refuge, our stronghold, my Lord. And you, O oh Lord, our soul rests. And it hopes, my Lord, because as the Bible says, we are under the shadow of your wings and there we shall find shelter. It is our shelter and our refuge until all evil days, until our sorrows and our difficulties pass away. Because there's nothing better than to trust in you, my Lord. Blessed is he who trusts in you. Blessed is he, O oh Lord, whom strength is the Lord. And blessed is he who knows to, how to praise you, how to worship you, who sings to you and who delights in you as we delight in you my lord in all these gatherings my lord so we thank you my lord what a great blessing and what a privilege it is to be here with you my lord what a privilege it is to be a part of your people of those who worship you my lord and that is that is why oh lord we are so grateful we are ever so grateful and, when, and we've come before you to praise you to worship you and to dedicate this gathering this service to you oh lord and we ask oh lord that you be with us tonight that you bless us my king we ask, O oh Lord, that you make this gathering beautiful, that you beautify it, O oh Lord, and let us delight and rejoice in your presence, in your blessings, in your miracles, and in the pure, perfect, and glorious doctrine that you will impart on us tonight. Bless us, O oh Lord. Bless us wherever we may be. Look at all the brothers and sisters that are gathering in our church, O oh Lord because there are many cities and towns where the church is now open and they're watching this gathering now, oh Lord. This gives us so much joy and we thank you for that. But there are still many in different countries where our brothers and sisters are congregating over the internet. But we know that you are blessing each and every person, that you are there manifesting in their hearts and we feel it inside of us, oh Lord. So we thank you, my Lord. Thank you for all this. Bless us, oh Lord. Bless your church. Let our Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. Amen. Great and powerful is the Lord. Let us open our Bibles, brothers and sisters. And let us read in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Okay, through verse all the way. Starting from verse... 22 and we are all going to read this gather we read this these verses let us pay close attention and being here reading the bible is a great blessing brothers and sisters so let's read with all our hearts verse 22 from chapter 17 of acts of the apostles i'm reading for the honor and glory of the lord then paul stood in the midst of the areopagus and said men of athens I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives life, he says he gives to all life, breath, and all things. 
and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. And why is it? In verse 27, it gives us the answer. It says, so that they should seek the Lord. That is why he made us in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. And this is a beautiful sentence. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like God, like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And that perfect man is none other than our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be his holy name. You may be seated now, brothers and sisters. And let us praise the Lord. Let us worship him. For he is not far from us. And if we worship him, if we praise him, and if we seek him, he will always be close to us. Always. So let us sing, brothers and sisters, hymn 177. It is titled, It is Heaven Down Here. And many don't realize why it is that we feel such happiness and joy. And the hymn itself gives us the answer. The title is the answer. It is heaven down here. That is why we are so happy. It is a heaven down here. What a beautiful sentence and what a beautiful hymn. What a beautiful, how wonderful it is to say to the Lord, Lord, it is a heaven down here when we live with you. Let us sing hymn 177. Midst, oh Lord, is truly heaven. Great and powerful is our God. How beautiful and how wonderful is the Lord. How glorious it is to sing to him. And 
it's a reality for many of us who know that we live in this heaven. And because of that, we need to preach to others, evangelize many. It would be wonderful if we could share the links of all the reflections and the sermons posted on our church's YouTube channel. Because by doing so, we are sharing that happiness with so many others. And now there's a tutorial on the screen. So let's not forget to turn on notifications for the church's videos and subscribe to the channel, those of you who haven't, and at, turn on all the notifications. But most of all, enjoy and share this treasure, this delight that we have found so that many others can be blessed and can be edified through the blessing of the Lord. Glory and praise be to, his, to our King. Let us also sing hymn 99, which is titled, Watch and Pray. Hymn 99, let's sing for the Lord. and worship and give all glory to the Lord. How precious it is to learn from him. All the things he teaches us are wonderful. And let's put this hymn into practice. Let us rise, brothers and sisters, and pray to God because prayer is a tool, a powerful weapon that God left for us. The Lord Jesus Christ solved everything through prayer and by trusting in the Father. And he's, he always teaches this, do not weary, do not be worried or anxious, because through by worrying or by being concerned, you will not gain an inch of height. So just pray to the Lord. And brothers and sisters, let us give thanks to the Lord first and foremost, because he has given us everything, everything that we enjoy in life. All our blessings come from him. But in this prayer, let us also ask him to remove all all obstacles that may be in our way, be it an illness, the pandemic, 
any misunderstandings or problems at home, anything that prevents us and hinders us from gathering together, from congregating, and from being able to go to the church. Let us pray to the Lord, asking him to remove all these things so that he can fill our hearts with joy and happiness. And with all reverence, let us also present our tithes and our offering and, and, and pray for them so that they may be pleasant to him, so that he may be pleased with them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, my Lord. We are ever so grateful, O Lord, because we enjoy of this heaven. We enjoy of that wonderful heaven that is walking in your footsteps, that is being on this path, O Lord, because one day, O Lord, you set your sights on us. What did we ever do to deserve such a blessing, to deserve this great favor, your kindness, my Lord, your endless mercy, my Lord, and it has come upon us to give us everything in life because in you we are alive and you we are everything oh lord and you we have everything we need and in you we feel that profound sense of happiness bliss and joy my lord and we have that desire oh lord to give you what is rightfully yours the praise worship and exaltation that you deserve oh lord and we want to be able to congregate once again we want to congregate we long and yearn to congregate so very much oh lord those of us who haven't been able to long for it and so we ask oh lord that you remove this evil from all around the world this illness this virus that has taken hold of the entire world take it away oh lord cast it away oh lord we also ask that you remove any obstacles any challenges any problems and adversities we may have in our personal in our personal lives as well as home oh lord anything that hinders us from congregating oh lord allow us to give you what is rightfully yours oh lord because that is your desire oh lord that was your commandment you wanted your church to be open every Every day of the week and we long for that to be the case my lord we also pray and ask oh lord that you bless the tithes and the offerings and we present them to you gladly with reverence and respect oh lord because out of everything that you have given us we gladly give you our tithes and our offerings oh lord we pray express and say all these things in the great name of your son our lord jesus christ amen glory be to the lord let us sing choruses to praise and worship the lord let us sing chorus number three, pray, pay tribute to the Lord, O soul of mine. But before we sing this chorus, brothers and sisters, I'd like to share a testimony with you. And it's a testimony that motivated me and moved me to, to, to sing this chorus. It's, it's about a sister who had been dealing with an illness in her digestive tract for 30 years. She went through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering because of this illness. And... Her diet was very, very strict and rigid. So she suffered quite a bit over the course of 30 years. And when she came to the church and she heard all the testimonies and the miracles and wonders that the Lord has done in our lives, she started to pray, just as we mentioned before, watch and pray. So she prayed to the Lord for her illness. And one night she had a dream and she saw herself in the congregation in our church. And she saw a being that was very tall come near her. And he said to her, you will live what Psalm 103 says. You will live what that passage of the Bible says. And he told her to read it. And that was a dream. That was it. And as soon as she woke up, the first thing she did was read Psalm 103. And she was taken by three praised by three sentences one that said pray pay tribute to the lord of soul of mine it also said he is the one who heals all your illnesses and the last one is he will renew your strengths like the eagle and she felt as though it was a promise from god and and and, and it was and it and, and that the lord had answered her prayers and so at that point she started to go to the doctors. Her medicine was not working anymore, but she went to the doctor and she told, she was told that if she was perfectly fine, that she had been healed. Glory and praise be to the Lord. So let us sing this beautiful chorus. Pay tribute to the Lord, O soul of mine. You are great, my Lord. You are a powerful, almighty God who works great wonders in our lives. So why wouldn't we praise you, O Lord? How could we not worship you? How could we not fall in love with you, O Lord? Being seen that you are so good, so kind, and so merciful. Blessed be your name forevermore, O Lord.
Precious is the name of the Lord. Blessed is the name of our God. How beautiful it is to sing to the Lord. How glorious it is to be able to sing hymns and choruses to him. So let us say it to him through this chorus. Chorus 35, it is titled, Oh, how great it is to sing to the Lord. Chorus 35, great is your name, O Lord. Perfect is your good and kind name, O Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, forevermore. We delight and rejoice. We rejoice in your house of prayer, my Lord. And we do everything for you, my Lord. So that you can be pleased with us. So that you can rejoice. So that you can look upon us with eyes of mercy and kindness. Seeing our happiness and seeing our praise and worship for you. and praise be to our God. And now a beautiful moment has come, brothers and sisters. And I am sure, I can only imagine that you feel the same happiness and joy that I and many of us feel. So let us rejoice in this moment. Let us delight in this moment because it is my pleasure to leave you with the worldwide head pastor of, of the church with tonight's sermon. Welcome, Brother Carlos Alberto. God bless you all. Good evening, brothers and sisters. God bless you all. I'm very happy to say hello. Thank you, Brother Oscar, and all brothers and sisters. A very big hug to you all. We love you very much in the Lord. We always remember you, and we're always united in prayer. We're really, truly excited to be able to spend this time with you. You may take your seats. There is a testimony that a few days ago someone shared with me about a sister who attends the church who had a promise from the Holy Spirit that their fa her family members were going to also come to the Church of the Lord, that they were going to know about God, and that she was going to have a chance to talk to them about the Lord, to evangelize them. And whenever the time came and the chance happened, that she was to do it. And sure enough, God indeed gives us chances when God wants to bring someone to the church, the Lord makes everything happen and puts everything in place so that at that moment we may understand and remember the prophecy and take seize the opportunity to evangelize people and to also do what God wants and what it is also our desire as well, which is that many people may come to the path of the Lord all the more our family members, but generally speaking, everyone, for everyone to come to, to know about the Lord. So what happened to this sister of the church, whose sister, she suffered an accident and she fractured something and she said that her sister's pain was very worrisome and it was a very strong pain, very intense type of pain. And when they went to the clinic, there were there was no place for them to, to take her in. And the truth is, her sister had to take a seat on the floor, although she had been she had fractured something, uh, to, to wait for her to be taken in. And her sister was so angry, she said, help me, do something. You, you have God. Pray to God and ha ask him to help me. You ask him. And the sister of the church said at that moment, okay, I'm going to ask God to help you, she said to her sibling. But you should always, you should also remember him. And so she went to pray to the Lord, and they were saying that she went to a side, and when she came back to look for her sister, uh, this was a month ago. Then, of course, they were absolutely worried about the bill of how much her stay was going to charge you. You know, getting a room because her sister was not 
was absolutely amazed that she had been assigned to that room, that hospital room that she said looked like a hotel, and she still didn't understand why or how. Yet she understood that it was an answer from God to her sibling's prayer. And something that confirmed it was that the time when the bill came, she said to her sibling again, the sister of the church, how are we going to pay? We, I, I don't have the means to pay, especially the, the room they gave me. Why don't you pray to God and why do you pray? And she, said, she answered, yes, I will. But remember, when everything works out well, remember God exists and God manifests himself in the church. God speaks so that you are able to go and receive prophecy. And sure enough, she prayed to the Lord once again to give her an, uh, a way out. And this time around, God magnified again, magn was magnified again because at the time they were going to pay their bill, they said that no, their bill had already been paid. In fact, the sister of the church said to the Lord, Lord, I have heard so many testimonies about people who say that when they go to pay, they don't have to do it anymore and that they tell them that someone else paid for them. How much would I like to live something like that with my sibling so she would, be would believe in you and seek you and follow you? That was a very intelligent type of prayer because indeed that was something that happened because they told them at the clinic the bill was paid, it, ha it was already canceled, and you, have, you don't have to pay anything. They, someone has already paid for you. That's as simple as that. And truly this has been a very big testimony to her sister and to their family who nowadays are seeking God and nowadays they acknowledge that there is a wonderful God, a blessed God, a powerful God, a great and unmatchable God who is in our midst. Blessed and praised is the name of the Lord. We magnify our God, our creator who lives and is so near us. The God who inspires us, he is the God who established in the Bible his teachings teachings such as the one we are that we are going to de elaborate today titled parents duties toward their children we had already preached about the children's duties towards the toward their parents today we're going to see the parents duties toward their children and to that end, we're going to read in our Bibles. Let us rise and let us read in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20. Proverbs, chapter 20. We are going to read verse number 7. What the Bible teaches us through Solomon. The proverb writer in the book of Proverbs regarding the parents and the blessing that, that is the children when their parents lead their lives in integrity and they set a good example for them. Proverbs 27 states, The righteous man walks in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. Amen. You may take your seats again, brothers and sisters. The title of the sermon, Parents' Duties Toward Their Children. But before we begin to elaborate on this, we start with a general concept, which is the one we just read in this verse number seven. The, ch the righteous man walks in his integrity, and then it states his children. When he says his children, he is referring to the righteous father. And that f righteous father is the everlasting father with, with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, it is the earthly father who lives or leads his life in integrity and righteousness and that's why his children are blessed in other words we are going to 
elaborate within the parents' duties toward their children. First off, what happens when father and mother attend the church, they come to the church, they're believers, they have conviction, they have converted to the Lord, and they convey, relay, inspire in their children a very good example. And those children of theirs are also believers, children who converted to the Lord, who love God, who follow the Lord, who have learned from their parents. That is the first example, the first consideration we're going to elaborate on. Later on, we're going to look at the case when the father is a believer and comes to the church, but his children do not. They are, they are unconverted. That, that's a different situation. And we're also going to see, lastly, the case of children who are believers, who have converted to the Lord, but their parents are not. And the thing is, we're just going to focus mainly on the situation so that all those of you who are tuning into this sermon, so you may know that we're talking specifically about the situation when father and mother are believers and children of theirs who are believers. Because perhaps someone might, a son might say, someone who's just starting to come to the church and his father as well, he says, well, my father has never set a good example for me. So my, my father doesn't have as much moral authority or a situation may also happen, which is that they're new in the church. And so a son, even though they're coming to the church, they see their, their father not setting a good example for them. And they say, well, my son is just starting out in the church. He's just starting to attend the church and, and he does, has not set a good example for me whenever he teaches me. I I see that he does not put into practice what he says. So here we're going to focus with mom, dad, who have given them their lives to God, who have set a good example for their children, have a moral authority, and their children who love God, who have received this example, who have received their parents' teachings with very good will and joy, and that's why they accept the correction from their parents, they accept their parents' uh, teachings, they're obedient to them. Whenever their parents give them advice, they value everything their parents teach them, and they really respect them. E even though the truth is a, a child should always re respect his parents. Even if their parents make mistakes, father, mother, then ch children still should respect their parents. And for instance, if you have a son who comes to the church and his dad does not, he must be patient and he must pray to God so that the Lord will transform him or will transform them all, the both of them. But he must show them respect because there's mu there must always be respect from their children toward their parents. Now, there are cases that I've heard about about parents who dedicate diabol diabolical rituals, witchcraft, sorcery, who commit crimes. Then that is a, a different situation altogether, wherein a son should not have that respect toward a misbehavior from their parents, especially when the son comes and approaches and tells his father, because the son could very well tell his father or, or mother, mom, dad, because based on the teachings, it would be worthwhile for you to watch the sermon that was given in the church that Sister Mary Louisa has given us. Eventually, that could happen. That could take place, a son toward a parent. Or when they converted to the Lord or a son who converted to God and the father did, uh, is not, it's difficult. But maybe if that, that child could make a suggestion to his father, you should s turn away from practicing or doing witchcraft. Dad, you should not you know, do any fortune telling because that doesn't really please the Lord. Let me show you here in the Bible. That could be done. By a son, but if their father still doing the same thing and rejects any advice, and on the contrary, 
He then starts to persecute him and forbid him from coming to the church. Everything changes. It is all different than that son who is, a, a, you know, of age, an adult. He should not subject himself to that. So these are many situations that can come about. And that's why we cannot be so categorical saying this has to be this way in a preset way, but rather we must look at every situation in particular. But generally speaking, we should say that parents should respect their parents. And generally speaking, we should say that the ideal, the goal in life is that this verse we just read in Proverbs should be fulfilled in our lives. How? By having a father and a mother who walk in integrity. Integrity means that they do not lack anything. They, comp they comply with all the commandments. They strive, and that's why they're, they're uh, upright before God, or righteous before God, rather. And that's why, because this example that they set for us, we revere our parents, and we value them, we cherish them, we, sub we submit to them, we hear their teachings, their lessons, their admonishment, their correction, punishment as well that should not be physical punishment and we and you know very lovingly welcome every, any admonishment from theirs any instruction any direction any lesson that they share with us but why because that parent that that father or mother have set a very good example to our lives and they have been an inspiration to our life in our lives and that is why we all as parents should strive to be exemplary so that our children may be joyful so that our children have nothing to reproach us as parents. And if our children, one day, should they veer off the path, may God not let this happen, well, let them not have anything to say against us and say that we set a, good, a bad example for them. Let, may they not say that they ever saw us, for instance, being unfaithful to our wives, setting a bad example that they saw us being irresponsible and not fulfilling our duties as parents in our household because that would be the most, the, that, the, the, the saddest situation. Or leading a sinful life and being a bad testimony. May our children never say anything like this. On the contrary, may our children, if they decide to go to the path, walk the path of sin in the world, the only thing, let them say, my mom and dad set a good example for me and they always motivated me to seek God. But we, we decided to take another path, the path of the world, the path of sin. But my father, my mother have no responsibility on this because that should, could also happen because in antiquity, children answered for their parents' sin and generations thereafter. However, today, everyone is held accountable for their own sin. Parents on their own, each spouse on their own, and likewise, their children and their grandchildren. Everyone is held accountable before God, and so, and likewise, salvation in the sight of God. Starting with the fact that baptism is individual, and the way we live, each one decides how to lead your life. And so... The joy, the blessing, it lies in those who are righteous as parents because the great, the ones who receive the benefits are the children. And truly, in practice, we see this with the children who, even though they're still 13, 14 years old, they already have conviction, even with their classmates in school, when they tell them that they should do whatever everyone else is doing, that they have, they should have girlfriends and that they should go to parties with men, have many girlfriends. And there are young people in the church in the church who say, no, no, I don't like that path. I, today I'm not, I'm not going to go to that party because I'm going to church. And whenever they ask them, why don't they have a church? They say, because it's not the time to get married. I'm just going to stay like this, single until the time comes when I find a wife and then I'm just going to follow God. And they, they're not ashamed of saying this. And even then, there are children who have so much conviction and so many young, ch young people in the church who, who have so, so much conviction because of their parents' example that they don't care if other people mock them, their schoolmates or classmates. To them, that doesn't matter because they are completely convinced that they're pleasing God. And that is a byproduct 
of the example, the conviction, the, the of the true conversion of their parents. Their children simply teach others, just as others also have the right to come up with plans, then the children of God, they also have a right to state their point of view when they, they're not ashamed. That's very beautiful because that's the way how people also will get to know the things of God. And so let us view a few examples in the Bible about parents and mother, par, mothers and fathers who have been dedicated to their children and the things they've done towards their children. Let's look at the example of Job, the way Job, the Bible states, he always prayed for their, his children and he fasted for his children. And he offered, or more than fasting, he offered sacrifices, is what the Bible says, burnt offerings, meaning he would present before God animals, oxen, and he would sacrifice these animals before God according to the number of his children, asking the Lord to have mercy on each of them unless they veer off or go astray. And there are examples such as the one of Eli, the high priest, who did not prevent their children from, co from committing sin at the door or the gate of the tabernacle, as the Bible states, and he did not have the conviction and the strength to admonish them. And God was not pleased with this. And his children did go astray. And he did not execute his job as a, as a father as he should correct them with greater emphasis. And in the case of Job, he even took action beforehand of anything that could happen with his children. As an exemplary father, he offered sacrifices to the Lord for his children according to the number of them all so that the Lord would pres would preserve them from going astray from the faithfulness to God and so it states in Job chapter 1 verse 4 and his sons would go and feast in their houses e Job 1 4 each on his appointed day and would send an invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them and so it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. Meaning, he would also call them and tell them to be to come to their senses and have an orderly life so that they would acknowledge their sins and so that they would straighten, straighten their path. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings that's the sacrifices that he would, or a, a, an oxen, or a, 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 or a cow, or a sheep, according to the number, w w with a blood to, it says, according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned, and also to cleanse them and sanctify them. And says, it may be, he didn't, he didn't rely on them, or was overly confident. That's what we ought to do as parents. We should watch over our children to pray for our children. If there is a son of ours who is rebellious, pray for your child. We ask, we pray to God to have mercy on that child of ours and not let him be lost. And Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Imagine the such righteous heart he had especially how concerned he was in the sight of God over his children so that his children would walk a righteous path before God. And in this way, does Job did regularly. That it, This is an example we should learn from parents, mothers and fathers, those of us who want to have integrity in the sight of the Lord because we have believed in our God and the living God and his promises and because we are here following him and because we long wholeheartedly for our children to follow this path, our happiness and blessings that we have seen and have partaken of, may they also be for, uh, for them and our grandchildren and for all the families of the children of God who congregate because we know that only thusly, being in the shelter of God, following the Lord with sincerity, 
cleansing our lives, we will be delivered from from wickedness, because this is a world of evil, world where the devil rules, a world where sin abounds, a world where sin and danger is at the ready, and the only certainty, sir, we may have is protecting our families, is with our good example. There's no other way. We have to be irreproachable. And the way we behave, that let may it be spotless and blameless, so that our generations be enlightened on that path. Let us also read in Proverbs chapter 4, the teaching from the Proverbist concerning what a father must do with his child. And in this chapter 4, first thing we could say when this Bi when the Bible talks here in Proverbs, in many chapters and as well as the Psalms, when it says my son or the father is teaching the son, that son who is that son? That son first is the people of Israel. That is important for all of us to bear in mind because this will help us understand the Bible better. When it says, my son, or my son received my instruction, that that son or those children are the people of Israel. But at that moment, but the people of Israel represent, symbolically speaking, the church today. So when they say, my children, it refers to the church. It, all of us, we are receiving our father, our, our everlasting father instruction, the God of heaven. And there is also an instance when we see the father talking to the son, who is the righteous man. He is the Lord Jesus Christ t teaching him. And at the same time, uh, a father teaching his children because those of the, the ones who educate are the parents. And that is our responsibility. If we want to be to have integrity in the sight of God, we must educate our children. We must instruct them. We must admonish them. We must correct them. We must see, make them see their mistakes. We must talk to them about God. We must teach them about God. We must give ourselves even more in the, ra in, the, in the raising of our children. And we must always have a big priority in our lives. And that should be our task, our duty in the sight of God, which is a supreme duty. Because it is something God has entrusted us with, a duty of instructing our children, of teaching them. Verse number one states, Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. Meaning, the teaching of a father, the instruction of a father, because a father or a mother, they were appointed to teach. But in order to teach, they need to put the teachings into practice first. Because if they put them into practice, their children will listen to them indeed with a better willingness and greater will. Because otherwise, a son might think, how could my father teach me if he doesn't have any moral authority and he has set a bad example? That is why it is fundamental to, have, to set a good example and integrity in a father and a mother as well. And that's where education begins and that's where the renewal, the renovation and blessings in the midst of people and in the midst of society begins. A father and a mother who have integrity. A father and a mother who set a good example. Therein lies everything. Verse 2, For I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. That, that is the, over, the everlasting father teaching his, his chi, children, the people of Israel, but also teaching us, the church of the Lord, and he is the father said giving a good lesson that God has given us that God has left us he also it says when I was my father's son says the Lord Jesus Christ the tender the only and the only in the side of my mother he also taught me blessed by the love of his parents but likewise they taught him he also taught me my father said to me let your hearts retain my words Keep my commandments and live. 
so that children may also cherish their parent when their parents teach them, when their parents tell them as the Bible states in the book of Deuteronomy. What did they do? Parents in antiquity had to do this because that was God's command that they had to teach their children in Deuteronomy 4. They were supposed to set the Sabbath aside to dedicate their lives to God, to meditate on God, but also parents were supposed to teach their children and their grandchildren because that was the command from God about all the blessings they had received from the Most High today. We should not waste an opportunity of every miracle, every testimony we hear, every evidence of the manifestation of God that is not little, but rather abundant, abundant blessings from the Most High. Let we, let us share them with our children immediately because he, it is an experience. It is what we live and this is what they will retain in their hearts. And... Let we, may we always share this, but may parents always set a good example, conveying this to their children. This is why verse number 9 states, Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, Deuteronomy 4, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they, you should share your testimonies to your children. Unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them so that when a difficult time comes, we may be steadfast as well as our children. Because every testimony and every experience and every thing the Lord has taught us, it is what will sustain us and held us up at any time during life. Us, but especially our children, because they need it. And God so established it. And teach them to your children. And not only should we retain them and keep them present always, those wonders, those testimonies, but rather we must teach them, we must share them with our children and your grandchildren. Grandchildren as well. That is what... Whenever we're gathering in the family, sharing the greatness of God, ultimately that is what will remain in our hearts, in the hearts of those beautiful children, in the hearts of those young people, of those children, young children. Later on, they will convey them to their generations, and so on the plan of God will it be extended, which is what the Lord has commanded us to do. Proverbs 22, 6 states, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is an expression that sometimes people will say, but truly it is a proverb and it is a word given by God and it is true. Those children, when they've been instructed, when they've had these lessons, in fact, Someone was telling me about the case of a young girl who lost his parents and the grandmother was the one who raised him up, who raised him. And this young child was raised by her mother, grandmother and the fear of God and a good example. And today she serves the Lord and she is a young woman who has been very highly blessed by the Most High, a great servant of the Lord. Therefore, they will know how to thank us because that is our lot in life. Train them up uh, as their children, lest they depart from the path of God. It is a fundamental part of our integrity, of our perfection. We, de we so desire before the Most High. A beautiful example is the one of the virtuous woman, which is the church itself with all her children. But she is the woman, the mother, who is looking after her household. Because she is the mother who leads her household, who 
stands by his child by her children, of course, alongside her husband, but we're referring to the to the woman who only good gives a good example and inspires her, her, her children. In these verses, we may read any of them and we see her virtues. But for instance, in verse 10, chapter 32, 31, who can find a virtuous woman for her worth is far above rubies. And then it highlights the way she is a person who watches over everyone. Verse 13 says she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her fruit from afar. She also rises. There's no irresponsible woman here. Her children are literally dying of hunger because she forsake them and abandoned them or neglected them. Nor do we have a father who is irresponsible and does not work to feed her fa his family. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers because she has a heart for everyone. Verse number 21, she is not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household is clothed with scarlet. Because that's the way she is. This is her, all her little children have clothes, clothes. And when the winter time comes, no one has a reason to be worried. Because she already prepared everything. Because this is the example of responsibility and fulfillment of their duties. Of profound love toward her children. That even her, her own husband... Praises her, the Bible says, because she only brings good and never evil. But her children see that wonderful wife and they see that mother who is second to none, who is dedicated like no other. For example, the heart as of a mother of Sister Mary Louisa, who is our, our, all of our mother. She thinks about everyone. She doesn't think about herself, but... She thinks about everyone else and her life is just dedicated to, to everyone and not for herself. An example and inspiration of generosity that should truly nourish us all. Because those are the examples that cast a light on humankind. And then in verse 28, her children rise up. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. That is the church of the Lord, verse 29, who does everything and she wins everyone's respect and admiration of her children and sons and daughters because of who she is, because what she represents, because of what she has done in the sight of our God. And then 1 Timothy, how can a son, a daughter, a, how will they not accept a lesson from, their, from that kind of a mother? How could they not accept an instruction from her. How could they not value her advice if the only thing she has done in life is to set a good example? When have they seen her give a bad example or do have a bad action or a bad or a sin? They've only seen her dedicated and dedication to for, fervor for their children Good example and love toward God, love for their wife, for their husband, and likewise, and vice versa, because these are mutual duties of in a, in a spouse, in a married couple. So, first Timothy chapter three, verse four, speaking about the elders, the apostle Paul taught them, saying that they were the ones who should rule their house, own house well, having his children in submission. But you reach that point, that submission, in in similar manner, like when we talk about marriage, when all through a good example and virtues have led that relationship, and when only the good example causes in those children obedience. There are many people who say, "How could you obey your father? So many things, or a mother? No, no. It's just that we shouldn't even obey them." It's not only obey, but cherish them. It's the only thing we've received in life uh, is their good example. How could we not cherish the 
words of a father or a mother, how could we not submit to them if they've only given us a good example, if they've always followed God, if we've never seen them sinning, we've only seen them, their lives revolving around God, how could we not welcome their advice, their lesson, their instruction, or an order, a command. And so it talks about these men, that they that their children must be in submission, but they earn this submission with all reverence. So you have reverence because there's honesty from father and mother. They have integrity. That's why it says with all reverence. Because due to their honesty, they have earned their, their the, the, uh, reverence and respect and submission from their children. And in Colossians, chapter number 3, verse number 21, the Bible teaches us that for us to attain integrity, parents should not make their children feel exasperated. In verse number 20, 21, it talks about the duties, the bang parents, and among those, Parents in verse number 21, and it, it says that fathers do not provoke. We should not provoke our children. What does that mean? Provoke. Do not provoke your children. Provoke means to irritate, to make them upset. And so they impose that. He imposed that on parents. So that children would not be discouraged. But they should instruct them. They should teach them. And there, there should also be a good measure with this to attain integrity. And be exemplary toward children. And Ephesians 6, he teaches us in chapter Verse number four, something similar to what we read. He said, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Most likely when they are scolding. They, you, you, we should not go overboard. There should be certain limits. But rather, we should speak with wisdom. And there may be a moment in which there may be some reproach with greater energy, meaning perhaps because of our children are have a bad behavior, but we should never punish them physically. Puni physical punishment existed in the law of Moses, but in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it didn't exist. It no, it no longer exists. But, but rather, it is the example, moral authority. We admonishing our children, perhaps at a certain time, a little hard, harsher, yes, but maybe because, but may, so that our children do not feel that there we are we are destroying or violating their rights. No, but rather. It says here, uh, uh, bring them up in the training and admoni admonition of the Lord. Discipline, but do not I'm not making them be upset so that they may disrespect their parents. Yes, because it'll be worse for their children. If a father admonishes a child and if the, if the child is uh, angry at that moment and the father keeps on admonishing, it is better for the father or the mother to say, I'm not going to keep telling him anything because what will happen is that he'll they'll talk back and disrespect me. And if he disrespects me, then he will lose blessings from God. So it is better for me to wait until my son is, is calm down. I've already admonished him and I'm not going to take him to a limit to, to have my son be provoked to anger, to wrath, and, may, and then he'll lose blessings because he disrespected me. This is a valuable 
advice to us all. And then in Proverbs chapter number 19, the Bible also teaches us when it talks about practical advice, Proverbs 19 verse 18, chasten your son while there is hope. Not physical punishment, but chasten as in admonishing something or maybe restricting a privilege, something you won't let him do, something that you reduce his ability to have access to. And the, son, the child will then understand that he has to correct his way. And do not set your heart on his destruction. Every, there is moderation to everything and wisdom to do everything. Now, when it comes to the situation of parents who are unconverted and, parent, and children who are believers, the Bible teaches us in Matthew 10, chapter 37, what, what, what I was alluding to in the beginning, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. The situation of a child who is dedicated to God, who converted to God, who is a believer, who believes in the living God, who believes in the gift of prophecy and re divine revelations, whose parents oppose him to attend the church, of, to him watching the sermons. And then that son, he is already an adult. And that son already has his own income. That son then he does not have to submit to the threats of a father or a mother who are unconverted, who threatening, who are threatening him with casting him out. And in that case, we apply what's written in chapter 10 of Matthew, verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. For God comes first. And if that mother, if that father threatening you, threat you with disinheriting you, with cast, kicking you out of the house, and they forsake, they're forcing us to renounce the Lord, then we apply this verse. 37. That we must be worthy of the Lord. And we must... Go, take God in the first place. Perhaps one day our father, our mother will come to their senses that they will come to the path of the Lord. But we do not have to be subjected to those situations. And then in the other event, which we find in Luke chapter 15, a father who is dedicated to God as well as his wife, but his children. They have bad attitude and they do not answer to their parents' example that they received in their household. Their parents should, will then continue being patient and mercy, merciful the path of chances for their children as it happened with this father here. The prodigal son. The prodigal son because he wasted all his inheritance because he wasted it away. And even though all of that happened when he decided to go back, the father helped him return and gave him a chance. And one of his children was angry and said, Father, but why do you do this? And why do you not do this with me? I've always been by your side. And the father answered, don't worry. That, because my whole inheritance for you is for you. But my son who was lost, I'm going to give him a, a chance. Your son, you may have. You who have has set a good example in your son or your daughter who does not want to seek God, you should still give them a good example. You should still be patient and give them opportunities, give them chances. However, if they persist in living in the world, 
and they are people who are already adults who and they they find they're financially responsible for you you should tell them make your own life look for a way to become independent and in that way the father's duty changes the father's duty or the parents duty is not to stay quiet when it comes to sin or remain silent when it comes to a bad behavior from his children with their children when they're already adults and when that parent when those parents have strived to help them to have mercy on them to be patient with them Luke 15 verse 20 states and he arose and came to his father but when he was still a great way off his father saw him and had compassion because that compassion that mercy of the, of the everlasting of the father and mother will be there and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and then in verse number 31 and 32 to compliment it but there's a limit to everything also there's something important when that child is when their son daughter is a child or a minor the parents should not give up on instructing them on see looking for a way for that child to come to church they must bring their child to the church and they say he says i'm not going to church you're going to church you're coming to church with us you're a minor he mu he is a minor he must come to church and parents should still can strive to give a good example to that child to that adolescent or that um, person who's underage and they should pray and they should promote the fact that they receive prophecy because it is fundamental for our children to receive prophecy as well all the more when out with our example but also with prophecy for those who do not want to seek god prophecy will allow them to find that path and laying on of hands also from us on our children come let me lay hands on you um let us pray to the lord and i'm sure that those children will accept because their example is more powerful than their rebelliousness. It is more powerful than a bad moment of walk, going, veering off from something the wicked one has tried to do to sadden them. But the blessing of God will also always overcome and be above everything. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Let us rise and we are going to pray to the Lord, begging him to help us so that our children will get ahead our grandchildren but especially that we meet our duties and may god help us so that we may attain that measure that god has set has determined that responsibility that duty of being a parent parents who are who have integrity and are exemplary it may be so blessed heavenly father we worship you and bless you. You do know as an everlasting father as that you are, as the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the father of the people of Israel, and as the father of us today, your church, what it means to be a true father and to be inspired by your example. Oh, everlasting God, oh, our creator, heavenly father, we worship you because of your mercy, because of your forgiveness, because of your goodness, because of your uh, greatness, your kindness, your generosity, your help, your manifestation, which that you're teaching us every day more and more. Every day you're giving us more and more victory. Every day you're watching over us more and more. Thank you, oh Heavenly Father, for being a true Father. That is why we, Lord, feel wholeheartedly committed to you our life right lies in your hand our life is for you because you are our ob our worship you are desire our fullness likewise we want to behave as our as pa with as parents toward our children help us lord to attain that example you have given us so that our children may be inspired and our, our grandchildren also and then so forth our society and so that your plan and your 
church that goes on in light of virtue. O God of glory, we worship you, and may this be so. Give us, O Lord, your blessing so that we may attain us. Give us what we lack and allow us to attain this goal. And may our children also and our grandchildren say, We are blessed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. May you bless the church. And may you bless your child. And, O oh Lord, bless the mother, spiritual mother you gave us, our sister Maria Luisa, who has a spiritual mother, as a, a great mother in our midst, has taught us life for, an, uh, for dedicating our lives to our service above life itself. What a great mother you have given us, Lord. Glory to you for this great and sublime and unmatchable blessing. Lord of glory, thank you. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for our families, for our parents, for our marriages, for our house, our children. Thank you, Lord. And may you, O God of glory, you may you remove any danger, any trap of the wicked one, anything that attempts against our life, our physical integrity, our health, our, our well-being, our, our happiness, the plan, your Lord, that you have for us. May all of this be removed, the work of the wicked one. May Satan flee and the God of heaven rebuke the work of Satan. May our Lord give us victory every day and may his blessing be so in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God. Let us sing, brothers and sisters. Chorus number 99, what a precious gift that the Father has given us. And number 99.
powerful is the Lord. Wonderful is the name of our God. Glory to our Creator, our God, our life, our everything. A big hug to you all. Have a good night and God bless you and keep you so long. Glory to the Lord. Thank you.